Lars y la chica real debe ser una de las mejores películas que hizo Ryan Gosling y pude hablar con Adam Kimmel, con su director de fotografía, que me contó cómo fue plantear los dos tipos de escena que tiene esta película. Por un lado, la comedia absurda que bordea por muchos momentos el personaje de Ryan Gosling y por otro lado, el drama que atraviesa este personaje que piensa que efectivamente la muñeca es real. Por eso también le pregunté cómo era tratar, cómo se llevaron con esta muñeca llamada Bianca durante todo el rodaje. We now return to Mira Akian and Contre with our latest interview. That, that film was hard for one reason that was not evident to me immediately when I read it. And that was, I don't remember the number, but I'm going to say that there was something like 170 scenes in that movie. And every one of them is a wardrobe change, a time of day change, sometimes a location change. You know, it's, it's very small pieces of the way it's written. And I love that it, that it has this kind of prose style to the storytelling but when you put that on a schedule every time you finish a scene and start another one makeup hair wardrobe continuity lighting all change i have a visitor where did you meet this person i met her on the internet yeah well everybody's doing that now when i read it i realized it was a really special project um it reminded me of a hal ashby movie you know like One of these movies where you have to sort of suspend your disbelief and create a whole world. And I hadn't made a film like that, you know. Uh, and I thought it had a really nice message behind it. And I thought the cast was great. He was very open to my process and sort of breaking down a script the way that I wanted to and helping helping him to do his work and him helping me to do mine. And it it just was a it was a pretty pretty easygoing, joyful experience. You know, Bianca's um, a missionary. I have to say that Ryan Gosling, you know, I was not a big fan before that because I had seen Half Nelson. And I got it. It was a good little indie movie, but I, my verdict was sort of out on him. And once I met him and we were prepping for that film and I realized how committed he was to it and how much he was bringing to it and how much he changed his appearance and all of his ideas... Uh, it became a big part of it, and we, we became good friends because of that film. My little brother is crazy, right? I mean, he's crazy. She loves kids. I remember saying, the film should feel really honest, and it shouldn't telegraph comedy. And to me, it's not a comedy. It's kind of a, a drama that's funny at times, and I didn't want to shoot a film that, that felt different than that. So having done Capote and having done this drama in the winter in a very kind of sparse landscape... There were some parallels to it, and I remember feeling like I, I don't want to over imbue this film with a sense of drama. I just want to honor the story. So there are moments when I went more comedic and like a flat two shot of people on a couch sitting, you know, that stuff needed to be played that way. But because the scene isn't just funny, it's more awkward and uncomfortable, it actually was the right way to do it. And, and in scenes where I could have a kind of quieter, more observational point of view. That's what I did. And Craig supported it completely. In fact, more than supported it, he really deferred to me a lot about how to cover and block and break down scenes. I think the more artistic uh, like settings that she did with the camera are the ones with Ryan and the doll that maybe yeah. you had this, like we are like picking, picking on them. Vo like, voyeuristic. Yeah. Voyeuristic, yeah. And then we have the funny moments where it's When, when the town or maybe the family is like trying to cope with the idea that Ryan is delusional yeah, yeah, and it, that's yeah. like so more like close-ups I think Correct. that's um, you know the, these films that are 30 day shoots which Capote was and I think Lars was about the same 28 days my feeling about it is to spend more time in prep to break down what a scene should be and how it should be covered and to never spend time on set shooting the entire scene from every possible camera angle, but rather to try to have a plan going into it of how you think the scene will want to cut and how you think the scene should be played and to, to use your resources to maximize the time for the actors and the director. So, you know, I'll, I'll sort of cover something in maybe three camera angles and maybe not even shoot the whole scene from the other two. Just create a master and then know that these other two cuts are going to be used once each. Yeah. So when you have the option or there's, or there's a scene that's complex and you don't know what the rhythm of it needs to be in the edit, 
you have to do it differently. But sometimes you can say, and, and a lot of Lars is, is Ryan by himself. So when you have an actor alone and you don't have dialogue, there aren't that many choices. And you can be more, if you look at the opening of that movie where he's alone in his garage and then the sister-in-law comes to the door, you know, I don't storyboard stuff, but I laid that out in terms of what the shots were and what they were needed for very deliberately. And we only shot what we needed and it goes together like it was meant to. Maybe he wants to be left alone. That's not what he wants. Craig had wanted to shoot widescreen. And I remember knowing right up front that that was not a good idea for a movie with a doll who needs to be in a wheelchair. And I was saying to him, Craig, how do I frame a two shot when Ryan, who's six foot two or whatever he is, six one, six two, and a little doll in a wheelchair, like <laughs> the shots are gonna be so big. And so I did a test out in the parking lot and that was the first time the crew was around the doll. And they, we had talked about like, this is, we have to make sure that this doesn't turn into a joke for people because you've got this rubber doll you know, so the makeup, hair, wardrobe, and doll handler departments were all taking it very seriously. And so that that helped everybody to be like, oh, it's it's not a joke. It's, a, it's not a, you know, yeah, it's not I, something I, to make fun of. Bianca's in town for a reason. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. How can we help? Go along with it. This must be Bianca. Well, welcome. They would prep the doll and bring it to the set, and we would be respectful of that process. And it didn't take long. I mean, I was working on with a lot of crew I didn't know in Toronto. So there was a sort of um, professionalism, an expectation of professionalism. There was no big familiarity among us. And so when they saw the way the director and I were working with the doll, they fell in. I don't remember having any any issues with it. Yeah, I, I read that you treated like the, the, the doll like she was an actress. Like she... Absolutely. <laughs> no, you, you have to. You have to, otherwise, you know, there's this smirking sort of Thing that can happen and, and it's not a good process I mean we treated her like an actress she was taken off set when her scenes were over she was never parked over there she yeah. was taken back to a trailer and lifted and put inside and, and also for Ryan I mean because you know to be respectful of Ryan's process he's a pretty method actor and he needed to he needed to act as if this was a real person to him so you couldn't be making jokes about it in front of him I mean he he actually, I think a lot of what he was doing affected the crew because it was respectful and it was sensitive. Are you not gonna go to work today, Gus? I don't feel good. Well, Bianca could help you, you know, she has nurses training. The makeup of the doll was changing, like, throughout yeah, the movie. we changed it to make her more human. I mean, we started with a very sort of matte, flat, pale kind of pancake look and we had done on my one test day, I remember we did a four or five makeup looks and we, we actually warm her skin tone up and then there's freckles, very subtle freckles applied and she, she becomes more lifelike. And I also changed the way I was lighting her. You know, I, I want to ask her you more that. flat in the beginning. And sure, I mean, everything you can do to help tell the story, you know, from a photography angle, that's, that's what the job is. So yeah. yeah, there's more light in her eyes towards the... Once you start relating to her, she becomes more human. Yeah, and what about the the, the other way around? Once she started like to feel sick, and then we we find out that the doll dies. There's a couple. There's only a couple of times that I remember at the end, really taking her. We didn't want to back off on the humanity of it, but she does. We we do frame it a little wider, so you start to feel the kind of oddness, like when they're sitting at the lake at the end, the last yeah. scene. You know, I shot these close-ups as, as humanly as I could, but then there's that one wide shot where it's <laughs> awkward because she's just this stiff, you know, she, it's clearly a doll. It can be a communication. It can be a way to work something out. Chances are he's been decompensating for some time. 